Well, hey, AP. Hope you're doing well when you get this video. Um, I want to go over the last two sections, uh, notes for uh, the genetics unit. Okay, so today we're going to talk briefly about some uh, traits that do not follow ratios predicted by Mendel's laws, you know, segregation, independent assortment. Um, some genes may appear to be linked, okay? And what does a map distance even mean between them? Some traits are on sex chromosomes. We already talked about that, uh, you know, and sex links, so X or Y. Uh, being, you know, pedigrees are important with that. Some traits are multiple genes, like height, skin color. Um, those also do not behave in a Mendelian way. You can also see that some traits aren't even in the nuclear uh, inheritance mode, not even in the nuclear DNA. Like chloroplasts, mitochondria, they contain their own DNA. Okay, and so mitochondrial DNA do not follow that. Mitochondria are transmitted through the egg because the egg is the larger. Um, it has the organelles. In plants, mitochondria and chloroplasts are transmitted in the ovule, not the pollen. Okay. And so they were maternally inherited both ways. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. Last year on the AP exam, there was a question about this. And um, I spent probably like 10 seconds on it. So I want to spend a little bit more time on it this year. But of course, it probably won't be um, that longer feature as it was last year. So you can see right here, Mendel's heredity factors were genes, which are segments of DNA. Okay, the location of a particular gene can be seen by tagging it. So you can see right here, and I know we've covered some of this, but I just want to cover it again just for future reference. But you can see, like, there's a gene location, right? Fluorescently labeled. And so mitosis and meiosis were described in late 18 hours. So Mendel had no idea about this stuff. And so he knew that there was particles traveling, and he saw all this, kept meticulous data, was good in math. And so Mendelian genes have specific locations, and chromosomes undergo segregation and independent assortment. Okay. But... And then, of course, that happens in meiosis, all right? But sometimes genes are linked, okay? So genetic linkage of genes on a single chromosome can alter their pattern of inheritance. And so, for example, genes, let's say this is a chromosome and this is a chromosome. Well, if genes are on separate chromosomes, like, that's fine, right? But what if this gene's here and this gene's here? They might travel together. And so this is what... A guy by the name of Thomas Hunt Morgan found out using Drosophila melanogaster, uh, which is the fruit fly, okay? And it's a model organism. And so some crosses, which Morgan did, did not yield expected ratios according to the law of independent hormones. Some alleles inherited, were inherited together, okay? And so this led him to the idea of linked genes. So for example, here's the cross. We did this in class, but just in case you forgot, it's, uh, you know, this, this is one gene, right? Two alleles for one trait. And then he used two letters for these two, um, you know, normal wings. Okay. And so this is the wild type, which means it's the one most prevalent in the, in the population, common population. And here's homozygous recessive for both traits, right? Well, and then I'm not going to do the cross because I don't have a writing pad. But if you do the cross, you expect a one to one to one ratio. Okay, and so you can see how this could be an easy chi-square problem. This is what we expect, right? One to one to one to one ratio. And what he found was this. So here's the parental phenotypes. And then the recombinants, which are not seen in the parents, right? Gray with small wings, black with normal wings. So those are not seen in the parents. Those are recombinant phenotypes. Uh, the null hypothesis is rejected. The genes do not independently assort. They are linked. They have to be on the same chromosome, okay? And so if linkage were absolute, we would only see the parental phenotypes, but there wasn't, it wasn't one-to-one. -one. We did see some recombinants due to crossing over. Crossing over allows us to shuffle those genes. Um, and so the production of offspring with combinations of traits differing from either parent are known as genetic recombination. Of course, that happens in meiosis. You see right there crossing over and you see how the genes have been uh, exchanged between non-assisted chromatids. And so recombinant frequencies, uh, calculated by dividing the total number of recombinant progeny by the total number of progeny. Uh, so they're higher for So recombinant frequencies are higher, which means there's more recombinants for genes that are further apart on the chromosome. Okay, so that, and that makes sense, right? Because if you had a chromosome, sorry, I know, again, I'm doing this with a mouse, so you have to forgive me. And if you have genes like super close together, 
even if crossing over happens, they possibly they probably are, you know, they go together. But if you had a gene like let's say here's gene A, and then let's say you have gene B right here, way down at the bottom. I mean, recombinant frequency is going to be higher there because crossing over probably will separate these more often than the other two. Okay, so that's what recombinant frequencies mean. Um, recombination of unlinked genes independent of So here's just an example: parental phenotypes, and then here's a recombinant offspring due to crossing over. So Morgan discovered that even when two genes were on the same chromosome, he discovered that recombinant phenotypes were observed. And that mechanism, he proposed that some process must occasionally break the physical connection. And so that process was later found to be a crossing over. Okay. And so here is just kind of what it looks like. Here's the eggs. Sperm can only give one, right? It doesn't matter. They can only give these two genes. And no matter what, you can see that recombinant phenotypes are right, chromosomes are right here. And here's the parental phenotypes. And so recombination frequency, 391 divided by 2,300. That's how many offspring there were in total, 17%. How did they find that out? They found that out by taking this total and dividing it by the entire total. Okay. All right, so moving on, we have something called a linkage map, which is a genetic map of chromosomes based upon recombination frequency. So this is called map units. So distances between genes can be expressed as map units. One map unit represents a 1% recombination frequency. Okay, so you can see right here, here's a chromosome. 9% between these two genes, 9.5% between these two genes, and 17% between B and BG. Okay, and so this is just a different gene on the um, fruit fly. And so genes that are far apart on the same chromosome can have recombination frequency near 50%. So they're physically connected, but genetically unlinked. And so Sturdivant, this like associate of Morgan's, used recombination frequencies to make linkage maps of fruit fly genes. And so you can see right here. So this is recombination frequencies. Here's the mutant phenotypes, wild type phenotypes. All right, red eyes, cinnabar eyes, et cetera, so on and so forth. You can see right here, you would find the map units between them. So here's the gray versus vestigial wings. Roughly 17-ish, right? Map unit, 17%. Okay. And you can see right here, these guys are on the same chromosome, but they would definitely be genetically unlinked. Okay. So fruit flies have only one pair of sex chromosomes uh, involved in sex determination, three pairs of autosomes. They have four chromosomes in total. Okay. And so X and Y, a gene that is only present in a single copy, for example, on males, right? X and Y. It's called hemizygous. You don't need to know that for the test. But Morgan's experiments showed that the gene for eye color was carried on the X. Wild type is R, mutant allele is white, and look what happens. And we've talked about sex linkage before. You can see right here, there's a, this X chromosome, X chromosome, this is a homozygous dominant female. Here's a white-eyed male. And no matter what, you can see right there, every fly is going to have red eyes. But if you have a white female and a red male, you can see all the males, right? Male, male, they have white eyes. Why? Because they came from mom, okay? So that's a great example of reviewing again about sex linkage, okay? And so here's just another example, and we practiced these before, okay? Patterns, they appear much more often in males. A male with a mutation can only pass it to daughters, right? Because his son gets those Y. Daughters who receive are carriers, only one X-linked mutation, so up here, Let's go back to the pedigree. You can see right here, he if he passes it to his daughter, so no matter what, that daughter is going to be, every daughter this guy has is going to be a carrier. Okay? Same for this guy, same for this guy. So all these circles are carriers. Okay? And so um, this just is two other, three other examples real quick. This is just an example of how females have two X's, correct? XX. And so what this means is that sometimes, Early on in development, one X becomes inactivated because you don't need double these, um, you know, the DNA for these genes, right? If only one X is needed for life, you know. So normally females have, only females have both alleles because they have two X chromosomes. If a female has heterozygous for the tortoise shell gene, she is tortoise shell. So you can see right here, the active X, black fur, and the inactive X over here though was orange fur. And so that's where you get the cat, okay? These are also known as calico cats. 
which um, no, another example of that, okay? And so this just means that sometimes X's are inactivated and then these genes are red, okay, in development. And then finally, the last thing about this little slide right here is mitochondria and plastids also have a small chromosome. And so you can see right here, this is uh, some organelle genes are important for organelle assembly and function. In plants, this example of mutation affects chlorophyll. Okay, so you can see right there, no pigment right there, right? Chlorophyll, lacking chlorophyll. And so this is all about female. Chloroplasts, this is cytoplasmic inheritance, okay? So just, yeah, what we talked about, mitochondria and, and um, having its own DNA and also chloroplasts. And so this leads us to our final discussion, which won't take very long at all, but environment. Not only is your phenotype affected by your DNA, it's also affected by your environment. And so this is, um, this shows right here, environmental factors influence gene expression and can lead to something called phenotypic plasticity. So the same genotype exhibit different phenotypes in different environments, okay? And so you can see right here, famous study, Scott Kelly and Mark Kelly. Scott spent over a year in space. And so you can see that, uh, where is it at, right here? They found a lot of different things in this study. You can kind of search this out. The study was published. Let's just look at gene expression. Uh, Mark also experienced normal range changes in gene expression, but not the same changes as Scott. Changes Scott experienced may have been associated with lengthy stay in space. Most of these changes reverted to baseline after he returned to Earth. However, a small subset persisted after six months. So literally, his DNA is being affected by his environment, notably being in space, gravity issues, such as so on and so forth. I encourage you to look this stuff up. I mean, of course, time is always an issue with all of us, but it's pretty impressive that our environment affects our DNA, okay? And so you can kind of see that right there. And so genotype equals one phenotype. Well, sometimes not. Sometimes environmental factors influence gene expression, okay? So the environment changes, expression of a gene, remember expression is turning a gene on or off, this can also change. And so definitely need to know what phenotypic plasticity is, which is the ability of an organism to change in response to stimuli or inputs from the environment. And I'll give you some examples here in a second, okay? There's great potential for confusion with this. Even though the phenotype is defined here to exclude the genome, in fact, phenotypic plasticity always involves a chain in gene expression, okay? So the gene might not be changed, but the expression of it is possibly changed. Okay, so for example, here's plasticity, stable populations, and then when the environment changes, it moves on to a different uh, type of species, okay? And so it enables organisms to survive in the face of unpredictable stress. We need a little bit of phenotypic plasticity ourselves, right? And so can be due to environmental factors and not necessarily to genetic diversity. Same genes, different forms based upon external factors, which is what that is kind of talking about. So height of 18-year-old men. Human height is a complex phenotypic trait, both by environmental variability determined by it and also genetic variability. So you can see right here. Bangladesh, Egypt, Uganda, why the decline, right? Well, something's happened in the, in the environment. South Korea is increasing. U.S., look at that. We've been multiple average, you know, we've gained too. So what's going on? Well, you, we could argue a lot of different things there. Um, and so nature versus nurture, it's a great, great question. Your DNA, right? Does it determine everything about you? And the answer is no. Um, you have the ability to determine, you know, through nurture and also through nature, right? Uh, but mostly through like how you live. Epigenetics, stuff on the outside influences it. And there's a lot of different links you can look up. This is a great link if you want to go into that. But epigenetics, so example, flower color. Hydrangeas, I believe. If the environment is acidic becomes deep blue and if the environment is more alkaline it becomes a shade of pink all about environmental differences the snowshoe hair example of this would be um, snowshoe hairs display a seasonal change in coat color from brown to white so let's practice a little problem here this transition occurs as a result of changes in gene expression during the autumn which is when the hair summer's coats are replaced by their winter ones 
The timing of this transition allows the hairs to remain camouflaged for predators during this, this snowy winter. So a group of scientists studied snowshoe hair uh, for a period of three years. They found that on average, the hoats transitioned to white before the ground was fully covered in snow before, which put the hairs at risk for increased predation. This mismatch between molting time and snow cover was due to winter weather arriving later in the year than usual. So you can see right here, here's a graph, okay? Start of the snowy period, end of the snowy period, okay? And so I want you to pause here and, and read the t possible answers. All right, so if you look at the possible answers, let's go through them together. The transition from brown to white is an adaptation to climate change, okay? Not really dealing with climate change in the problem. Uh, gene expression changes, yes. Okay. Amount of snow, well, they their their coats change before the snow cover. All right, so let's go back up here. You can see right here, star of snowy period, percent of white coat. Well, I mean, they already started increasing, right, in October. And so that can't be the answer that happened before snow. Transition from a brown to white coat as a result of gene expression changes induced by autumn daylights. That's pretty good. But, and then let's just do like a little mark possible. Uh, the transition from brown to white coats occurs as the genes for having a white coat become more common in the population during the transition from fall. Well, these genes are always around. These genes aren't necessarily... You know, more common in the population or not. It's more just... Um, Oh, sorry for the pause, my system messed up. But yeah, it's not more common, it's just the ex expression is different. So we're looking at the expression. So expression here, and we're looking at expression there, okay? And so I think the best answer is C, from what we've been given, okay? And so you can see right here, temperature dependent. So in mammals, sex determined by X and Y, and birds, Z and W, you don't have to know that, but reptiles, each individual received the exact same set of chromosomes. So if the egg is relatively cold, and this is just an example of epigenetics, the chromosome will create male hormones. If, it, if it's warm, female hormones. And so you can see here, cold, warm, and there you go. At a certain temperature, the percent male goes pretty high, right? Almost to zero there. Temperatures get warmer. And so these are just different examples of that. So the research team found that a thermosensitive protein called trip V4 is present when the developing algae are going out inside it. This protein is responsive to warm temperatures in the mid 30s, can activate cell signaling. There, well, you know that what that term means, right? Cell signaling by inducing calcium ion influx, and so it, it turns on these genes for oh, sorry, for uh, male development, which is kind of crazy to think about that the environment can do that. Okay, so two more slides, really quick. And variable expressivity. So, so individuals of same genotype but can do a lot of different stuff. Some might develop a severe form, some might develop a milder form of a disease. That's an example of variable expressivity. And then incomplete penetrance, which means a certain genotype may or may not develop the phenotype. It depends upon the environment. So this is complete. No matter what you get it, and it's incomplete. Well, yeah, you might show it, you might not. Different examples with that. Okay? And so there's a practice problem if you want to. Hope this was uh, helpful, guys. I'm sorry again that um, I was out, but uh, be looking for more emails from me. God bless.